I'm, I'm honestly, Constantine, I'm ashamed. Uh, I'm truly ashamed that I didn't speak out against some of the authoritarian creep that I saw uh, in our response to COVID. Mm. Um, I tried to employ, I think we call it, uh, I think it's called Hanlon's razor. Don't attribute Hanlon's law. Uh, don't attribute to malice what could be reasonably explained by incompetence. I tried to hold that in my mind just as a general framework mm. for thinking about the world. Mm. <clears throat> At the same time, I saw people just roll over and willfully surrender their freedoms. It was so bad in Australia, actually, that when they began opening up, people were protesting uh, a little bit and saying, no, we want to stay locked down. And the Australian example is, is, is unique and needs to be put in context because Australia has never really had a revolution. They've never had to fight for their rights. They call it the lucky country. There's this book that came out in the 60s, The Lucky Country. Of Australia has lots of natural resources. It's surrounded by ocean, blah, blah, blah. You know, there's a lot of reasons for them to not, to, to trust their government. There's less reasons in Australia for them to be distrustful mm. of government and of authority than perhaps there is in the United States or the United Kingdom. I understand that. And I think that's an important point. So you, like, Australia is not the United States and Australia is not the United Kingdom. That, that has to be recognized. That being said, whether you go to, you know, use the Australian example where there was some really nefarious activities going on in Australia. I was there. Mm. Um, like really head scratching stuff that if you had told us five years ago that we'd be experiencing that people again would have just said no way man come on like you're you're drunk go home um so i'm ashamed that i didn't speak out against that I, you know i was in uni i was finishing school i was finishing my first book blah 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 lots of excuses i was busy with my life um i was working you know at quillette full time I, I, I had things going on um, but looking back on this, mm. two, two things become clear. One, I'm ashamed that I didn't speak out against this, and I'm happy to go on the record and say that. Two, the, the extent and the numbers in which good, decent, ordinary people rolled over mm. and said, here's my freedoms, take them. You can have, I won't put up a fight, just take them, it's fine. Um, in all of the Anglosphere uh, and in many other parts of the world, was uh, it is uh, retrospectively shocking. And you know, the another funny thing, people, our historical memory is so short. I don't, we don't really talk so much about COVID anymore. You're out at the pub, you're you know playing you're playing uh, footy with some mates, whatever you're doing. Um, we, we don't remember what you you, you finished uni, like your uni was like you were like off campus the whole, what do you mean? Like you worked from home for like two years, three years. Like remember when Zoom wasn't a thing? People like didn't, I didn't use Zoom. Mm. I was using like Skype. And like, you know, in 2019, I was like, I had like Skype okay. someone. Who, who the fuck uses Skype now? Mm. And there was this transformative thing that happened. So shame on the record and two, real astonishment. And this is, I'm saying this because of something you've said that I was surprised. I am surprised, and it sounds like you're surprised too at at people's. We think that people people say, "Yes, of course, I support freedom. I like my freedom." And yet, when push came to shove, uh, they did not stand up. They rolled over and they allowed themselves to get fucked. Does that expression lay back and think of it? It's a rather vulgar expression, but lay back and think of England. A lot of us laid back, thought of England. And I actually don't know. think a lot of people did. I think some people did. Um, but I think a lot of people went much further than that. They wanted the government to come in and take care of the problem makers because, and, you know, as someone who's part Jewish, I can tell you. I'm full Jewish. You're full <laughs> Jewish, right? So we both know that in history, generally speaking, when shit goes bad, people are always looking for someone to blame. Yeah. Right. And so. I, I used to joke during the course of the pandemic, this is like the first time there's been a pandemic that they haven't blamed on the Jews. So at least that's a relief. <laughs> but but the, you know, the unvaccinated became the Jews. 
or the people who refused to wear a mask because they looked at the scientific evidence. They became the Jews or whatever. Do you see what I mean? So when things go bad and people are scared and there's a panic and no one knows what's going on and there's a lot of fear around, uh, and you've got to remember there was a lot of fear around. Mm. Right? The prime minister of this country is carted off to any, everyone's staying at home, washing their hands 57 times a day, clapping for the NHS. <laughs> a lot of people in that moment go, who can we blame this on? And how do we just get things, you know, get things stable? You know, stable is, we want things stable. We want things yeah. safe. And I understand, you know, if I was in my 90s and I was overweight and, and I had a lot of concerns about this disease being really bad. And by the way, I've had COVID three times. The two times Me too. <laughs> that I had it that were not, that were bad, it was really bad. It's, it's not a trivial disease at all. It's not something you want to have a bunch of times. And it's something that um, was definitely worth taking seriously. Absolutely. But when you take something seriously, that means that you carefully consider the trade-offs of the actions that you pursue in order to mitigate that thing. You know, I do take seriously my son's safety from falling. It doesn't mean I make him wear a helmet at home, Right. There is a risk to reward ratio with all sorts of different things mm. that we do. And what happened during COVID, come back to the trade-off denial at point, we just went, you know, save lives. And we didn't think about, well, okay, we might save some lives now. How many lives are we going to not save or curtail or end with the policies that we're taking? Curtail, I think, a lot. Right. And... Uh, in addition to that, I think the other thing that we've become unwilling to say is there is absolutely no question, if you look at the facts and the reality, that freedom has a cost, including in safety and including in lives. Mm -hmm. Because we allow people to drive cars, tens of thousands of people are killed and maimed every year. The freedom to move around in a motor vehicle that moves at fast speeds has a human cost. Yeah. We do not ban the invention of cars or, or whatever. We have certain rules around to try and manage that. But there is, no one wants to say this, there is an acceptable number of deaths a year from car accidents yeah. that we are prepared to tolerate. And that way of looking at things is very unpleasant for all of us. And it was not applied to COVID at all. And I kept saying, that I had only one question that I ever wanted anyone to address in the, in, when it came to lockdowns during the pandemic. And every week or every day, at certain points, we had uh, press conferences with the prime minister in which all the journalists kept asking the same question. Why aren't you locking down harder? Why aren't you going faster, deeper, hard? You know, yeah, yeah. A, a guest of ours called it's it like the a porn Nike commercial, faster, deeper, Yeah, harder. well, it's like the pornification of, 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 of healthcare policy. <laughs> <laughs> the question I always said to them is, why does no one journalist, and I have never heard a journalist ask any, any politician this question during the pandemic or even after, how many people do lockdowns kill? How many people have you estimated your policies will kill? Because you cannot make the decision to lock down until you have that figure. Because you have to weigh both things and say, well, look, we could save... We estimate we might save 50,000 people now. Yeah. And this will kill 1,000 people. In the situation where it's life and death, that's a pretty good deal. So we'll lock down. Or you might estimate, and we're increasingly starting to see this, that there's going to be a lot of missed cancer diagnosis. There's going to be lots of lots of things that happen as a consequence of the approach we took. Sure. That have an impact on people down the line. That approach was never, never done because people lost the plot. People got scared. And they demanded authoritarianism from the government. So I don't know how many people lay back and th thought of England. I think quite a lot of people went, oh, oh, there's a danger. Shut it down. No, no, I want, no, no, no. I want, I want the, the those that's people. An, that's an important, that's an important distinction.